I think after listening to Sally and already knowing something about her views, that her views and I back into each other and share a key component, but we have an utterly different sense of the dynamics of social life. So I'll now proceed to explain that. Let me share my... All right, so I have just one screen, which uh, just summarizes the topics I want to very briefly address. So let me start, and I should say that um, what I'm going to say about an account of social change combines what philosophers call an ontology and epistemology, and that is due, I think, for the reasons for having um, such, a, such an account. One needs both. So let me start with the notion of change. Um, I'm going to just start from the idea that the world is full of events and processes. That is, the world is not a static place. And you can use your intuitions as to what events and processes are. Uh, I could say more about these things. Um, but the key point about events and processes is that when they occur, they leave behind differences. That is, the very occurrence of an event or a process marks a difference with the prior state of the world before they occurred. And all the effects that arise from an event and process also similarly mark differences from prior states of the world. And so a world full of events and processes uh, contains a great number of differences. And there have always been philosophers who have said that difference is change. Uh, the people in social theory, I would, who argue things like this, are I would call flow or becoming theorists. Uh, Henri Bergson, Gilles Deleuze would be two prominent examples. This yields the view that change is omnipresent. Um, now, a well-known issue with this view is that what happens to persistence? Um, on this particular view, there is no persistence, and that's fine. Um, the lack of persistence, the idea that change is omnipresent, leads to Heraclitus's paradoxes, which may or may not bother you, depending on what sort of philosopher you are. Now, I would prefer to think that the world contains persistence in addition to change. And uh, persistence can be roughly understood as continuation of something over time. But this means that both change and persistence exist through or are incompatible with the cascades of differences that are introduced by events and processes. And we might recall in this context Derrida's formula that identity is sameness over difference. So it can't be that difference is change or that change is difference. Only some differences or aggregations or sets of differences are gonna qualify as changes. But which ones? Well, I, I have argued uh, in the book that um, Robin referred to that it's significant differences that qualify as changes. So not all differences that happen in social life will qualify as social changes. Now, to be very brief, significance depends, of course, on the actual differences that take place. It matters whether the revolution actually overthrows a government or not as to the significance, but it also depends on what the differences are juxtaposed with and then the judgment of the observer. So the context in which they are occurring. And so uh, change is significant difference. Okay, now social change. Social changes are by definition changes in social phenomena. So I think I'm pitching here the notion much more broadly than, than Michelle is. Um, and this would, by the brief comments I just meant, it would mean significant differences between social phenomena and prior ones. And this makes an account of what social phenomena are crucial to a conception of social change. And I don't wanna go into any detail here, um, but um, I have argued that uh, we should think of social phenomena as consisting in complexes or slices or aspects of bundles of practices and material arrangements. 
where I think of practices as organized doings and sayings and arrangements of simply interconnected material entities and these bundle together. So social changes, changes in social phenomena are significant differences in complexes and constellations of practices and material arrangements. Okay, so let's move on to C, I'm sorry, to three. Bundles and complexes of practices and arrangements connect. In fact, they connect up such that we can speak of an entirety of interconnected practices and arrangements. And I use the word entirety deliberately so as to avoid the world word whole. I do not think, and this could be, a, I think is a major difference with, with Sally, is I think that, that bundles and arrangements uh, or relations, the way she spoke of it, do not form holes. They do not connect in large scale systematic ways. And in any event, this entirety of interconnected practices and arrangements, I call the practice plenum, using the word plenum deliberately. And this plenum stretches around the surf on the surface of the globe. It extends a short distance under the surface and a little bit further into, into space. And so also if social phenomena are slices, aspects of bundles of practices and arrangements, they are slices or aspects of the practice plenum. Okay, now causality. I am simply going to help myself to the idea that causality is one thing being responsible for another. That's a very broad conception of causality. It's taken from Heidegger, who attributes it on his interpretation, of course, to Aristotle. And in the book that uh, Robin mentioned, I argue that in the practice plenum, what I call activity chains and material events and processes are what are responsible for social changes. That is for significant differences in bundles and complexes of practices and arrangements. And in fact, it's usually nexuses, combinations of activity chains in material processes that are responsible for that cause uh, significant differences in bundles of practices and arrangements. The practice plenum is crisscrossed by chains, nexuses of chains and processes that come in waves that, that, that can circulate around themselves in various ways, uh, but form that we, um, and they leave behind differences and changes in bundles and constellations of practices and arrangements. And it is these nexuses that are, that are causally responsible for social change. And I should say they are what we might say are ultimately responsible. Um, that is the dynamics at work in social life are found in the practice plenum, ultimately in these nexuses of activity chains and processes. Okay, so let's move on to point four. All explanation in, uh, of social change is historical. Explanation is causal explanation. That is a description or a specification of what is responsible for whatever you're interested in. So that means that explanations of social changes are descriptions of the causality giving rise to them. And as I just discussed, it is these nexuses of activity chains and material processes that give rise to significant differences um, in the practice plenum. And so explanations of social change um, are descriptions of the particular nexuses that are responsible for whatever you're interested in. That is what leads up to their occurrence. And that is tantamount to a description of history. So this pushes in a number of directions. It's not only a description of history and what leads up to it, but it's also a view that emphasizes the importance of getting into the details. However, the and this now leads into point five, the nexuses that lead to social changes 
especially complex phenomena, connect, uh, complex changes, have an element of unsurveillability to them. That is, they are difficult to grasp in their complexity. This makes description equal enumeration, or as Latour would say, following the actors, uh, makes it both cognitively and practically impossible. But if a description's account is an actual explanation, it must provide compre a comprehensible grasp of this complex nexus. That it, and I argue that this is affected or conveyed communicatively by a, what we can call an overview that is um, an Übersicht, uh, which is Wittgenstein's term. And so overviews capture the gist of a complex feel, in this case, the complex causal nexus. It cap it, an overview captures what is significant, essential, or salient about that complex feel. They can, uh, overviews can contain sweeping characterizations of things. They can contain generalizations. They can take the form of narratives as they do in history. Uh, they can include descriptions of specific happenings and sequences of events they can incorporate numbers and statistics. There's a wide variety of forms that overviews can take. And they also tend to use specific concepts. So for instance, I take the concept of a social movement as an example of a concept we use to give an overview of particular sorts of nexuses of activity chains and material processes. Um, and um, the question then vis-a-vis uh, -vis Sally's talk would be whether her talk of structure with the nodes and relations qualify as a concept or as a competitor to the type of dy dy dynamic principles that I've just described. And finally, let me just conclude with by saying a word about theory. Um, the um, I would tend not to use the word theory in this context. I would tend to use the word like an account is a, is a fine word. Um, in, in the social disciplines for, for a long time, the principal understanding of theory was as explanatory apparatus. And so what I offered is not a theory in that sort. It's also not a theory in the source in which people um, offer accounts of the sources and origins of change and mention things like innovation, changes in ideas and culture, environmental events, conflict, social movements, democratic changes. Um, my account bears this, why I mentioned it earlier, it offers an account of what is ultimately going on when people cite that these other factors as having a ca making causal difference to uh, social life. Uh, rather, it's a theory only in the sense of some abstract general account of what social change is and what it is to explain it. And so um, uh, it may be a philosophical theory indeed, and not and less uh, a social theory. All right, so I'll stop there. Thank you very much.